Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the spring series of live events of the MITx MicroMasters in Supply Chain Management. I'm Miguel Rodriguez Garcia, a researcher at the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics in Boston. I'm the course lead for SE1X Supply Chain Fundamentals. So first of all, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. This is the final live event of the spring series, and we have a very special guest who is not new to these events. In fact, he, is, uh, he was here a couple of years ago, and since his talk was so well received by all of you guys, we decided to invite him again. But before we introduce our guest speaker today, I'm happy to be co-hosting this live event today um, with my colleague, Jeff Baker, uh, course lead for SC3X Supply Chain Dynamics, who in fact was a speaker for one of these events just a couple of weeks ago. Different role today, Jeff, probably more calm, more chill. How are you? I'm doing great. And you know how much I love to talk, Miguel. So it's, uh, but it is great to be here. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here with you all. Uh, we're excited to share some great insights about risk management uh, strategies in this live event. So today we're going to follow this agenda. We're going to have about 25 minutes of presentation where our speaker will be talking to us. After that, there's some time at the end, about 15 minutes for Q&A. So this is going to be a great topic, a great contrast from this year to a couple of years ago. So please, uh, think through questions and answers, make sure you use the Q&A feature on Zoom, not the discussion, but the Q&A feature, so not the chat box. And then what Miguel and I will be doing is we'll be taking as many questions as we can. Uh, and before we introduce our guest speaker, we want to share something with all of you, right, Miguel? Yeah, that's right, Jeff. So we just want to remind everyone that the MITx MicroMasters in Supply Chain Management is a program that we developed here uh, at the Center for Transportation and Logistics at MIT. Uh, as well as Supply Chain Fundamentals and Supply Chain Dynamics, the MicroMasters program includes three other courses. Uh, so five courses in total. Some of them are currently open for enrollment, SC0X, uh, SC2X, and SC, um, sorry, SC2X and SC4X, yeah. And we'll be posting the link in the chat group in case any of you guys are interested in completing the program. Actually, SC2X and SC4X are going to be released in a few weeks from now. So we'll keep you posted. Um, yeah, I'm sure you love all the courses if you're already taking SC1X and SC3X. Um, without further ado, I think it's time already to introduce our guest speaker, Jeff. All right, great. Thank you very much, Miguel. Yeah, today we are honored to have Jimmy Rose as our guest speaker. So Jimmy and I, Jimmy and I met back in 2018. I just graduated from the program <clears throat> and uh, Jimmy had just been accepted into the, uh, the, uh, the master's program at MIT and uh, I was assigned as his mentor. Um, so We've uh, got a lot of learners out there, I know, that are aspiring uh, to complete the MicroMasters, potentially uh, continue on to a master's degree, whether at MIT or at some other university. Jimmy's a great example of how the MicroMasters program can really springboard your career. Um, he's had su uh, tremendous success after MIT. He's currently the Vice President of Global Strategic Sourcing at Temper Sealy International. He's got over 25 years of experience in sales, operations, engineering, new product development, and sourcing. Jimmy spoke a couple of years ago on this topic, but what was important back then is not quite as important now. So there's a lot of stuff that's changed, really, really underscoring the very dynamic nature of our supply chains and the need to stay on top of things. So Jimmy, welcome back to the MicroMasters program. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, and, and I want to thank you guys for having me. And, and I want to give a plug to the MicroMasters program I've been a lifelong learner, and I can tell you when I discovered the program, uh, I mean, it really excited me about learning about really what's underneath uh, the dynamics on supply chain and really not adding to my practical knowledge with really the foundational elements that go behind uh, good supply chain management. So huge supporter of the program encourage people here in my organization to do it. And we have several people who've uh, gotten their credentials over the last couple of years. So uh, thank you again for having me. Really love the program. Absolutely, Jimmy. Thanks so much for joining us. So let's get started. The floor is yours. Okay. Let me share my screen and we'll get started. Okay. So uh, as Jeff said, a few years ago, uh, I got the opportunity to speak to you about supply chain risk management. And if you kind of think about what was going on two years ago, we had just come off a series of natural disasters, black swan events, incredible uh, you know, supply chain disruption. Um, 
And that was first and foremost on everyone's mind. And when I was asked to speak to you, I thought, well, let's have a little fun with this. And uh, so, you know, I called the uh, the presentation Supply Chain Risk Management and FX Sourcing. And the reason I did that was because at the time, there were all these buzzwords being thrown around and you heard people saying friend shoring, near shoring, and all of these reactions uh, oh. that were happening to uh, to the disruption we were experiencing. And really the context of my presentation was that there's not one answer and the details matter. And sometimes mitigating risk can be absolutely counterintuitive to what you're hearing people talk about. Maybe nearshoring is not how you solve a risk issue. Uh, it could be just the opposite. Really, the details matter on what you're trying to solve for. So as we really fast forward a few years, uh, a couple of things. Uh, I would say the world is still a risky place to operate supply chains. Um, a lot of the same risks are out there, but some of them have kind of changed, right? But maybe more importantly, as uh, as businesses, right, we've moved on. And it's important to think about how that's influencing how we mitigate risk. So let's start off by taking a quick look at where we were a couple of years ago. When we think about 2022, again, context being 2021 was a terrible year. All kinds of things were going wrong. We think about protectionism. We still had the impacts of COVID and the pandemic, multiple coming off multiple natural disasters. Uh, transportation reliability was at a, at a very low level. We had new armed conflicts uh, in the world, energy shortages, specifically in Europe, and cyber attack, cyber attacks, right, which were hitting our supply chains. So it was a really uh, disrupted world that we had just come out of and we're still living in. When we compare that to now thinking about 2024, um, you know, really the headline is most of these risks still exist. Now, there have been, in my opinion, a few changes, you know, COVID less of a direct impact, but I would add labor. Uh, natural disasters, I would modify that to add climate change as a risk. And then uh, we don't experience uh, the same type of acute energy shortages, but I would say now we think about ESG and specifically the impacts of increased regulation uh, and governance as risks within our supply chain. So with that being said, I'd like to start off with my first poll question that I'd like to put out to the group. Uh, and this is really about how have you been impacted uh, in your supply chains? And think about here, things like reduced capacity last year in the Panama Canal, increasing governance requirements, the impacts of labor force turnover, or maybe more than one of these items. So let's take a minute and get a little, get a little feedback back from the group. We are getting a lot of responses, so that's good. We we have over 70 already. All right. We can give you a few more seconds because people are still answering. Seems like a lot of people actually were hit by all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, definitely. Should we end the poll? Whenever you're ready, and then maybe yep. take a quick look at the uh, yep. at the data, see what we heard. Okay, yeah, I mean, uh, looks like uh, as you said, a lot of people hit by everything, um, and you know, one thing that uh, I'm a little surprised on, but was one of the things I really want to talk about was the number of responses of people being hit by the impacts of labor force turnover. I think this has been an overlooked element in supply chain risk. You know, if you really think about uh, the name that was been given, the great resignation, 
it makes you have to recognize that as much as we build systems to manage our internal and extended supply chains, we use people to run these supply chains. And we just come off of a period of time where we had a tremendous amount of turnover uh, in our labor force. And, uh, and that impacts the effectiveness of our supply chains. And I can speak uh, from personal experience that I see, especially in external supply chains, times where our suppliers are just less capable due to the amount of turnover that they have. And this represents a risk. I also just wouldn't overlook the fact that the labor force is changing. And that's really a global statement. Uh, if you think about uh, maybe in the Western world, we think about expectations about uh, what people expect in their work life now. But really, you can generalize and say, depending on the region you're looking at, there are real challenges, but different challenges. It could be rapidly aging workforces in certain parts of the world, or it could be parts of the world where you have uh, very quick changes, uh, rapid changes in, for example, wages or in the, the uh, labor laws in those in those areas, and all that impacts how our supply chains work. So moving on, uh, I added climate change to natural disaster, and this is really hitting on the idea that if you think about what we experienced with the Panama Canal, um, the frequency of events that we experience uh, impacts our supply chains and the reliability of our supply chains. And maybe that's a physical thing in the sense of uh, the example of the uh, of the Panama Canal, or if you manage supply chains which are full of agricultural commodities, that influences how those supply chains function and are things that we need to be thinking about. And then the last one that I'd like to point out is ESG. And here I'm really keying on when we think about regulation and the uncertainty around re regulation, that impacts how people invest in their supply chain infrastructure, where they invest in their supply chain infrastructure. And that uncertainty is an in influences how effective our supply chains can work. The other point is governance. As we have increasing requirements for governance, we're not only increasing the amount of resources it takes to manage our supply chains, but we're increasing the cost of switching. We're essentially making our supply chains less agile and less resilient because it's more difficult for us to collect, create duplicity within those supply chains in the case that we have an interruption somewhere. So all these things, are adding to the complexity. They're all still part of this big risk outlook that we're uh, that we're working in. Um, but all in all, I'd say it's still better than 21 and 22, right? Um, so, okay. Now let's take a minute. To talk about priorities. So here, you know, I'd like to ask the group again, you know, where does supply chain risk management rank as a prior priority in your organization? So if we could get the poll going, is it number one? Is it in your top three? Is it on the list, but outside your top three? Or is it essentially not a priority? How's it looking, Miguel? So right now, yeah, people are still participating. We have almost 90 people already uh, 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 who have voted. Yeah, thank you so much uh, to the audience for their engagement. Yes, I think we can give it a couple more uh, seconds for people to end voting and then we, we can just end the poll. Okay. I think we can see the results now. Okay, so it looks like uh, a strong majority in top three. Um, I I would say that's directionally correct based on you know what I see and what I experience. And the reason I say directionally correct is because I think it's easier for people to understand what their absolute number one priority is. 
Uh, and then as you kind of get into your overall priorities, it gets a little harder, right, to really say what's the difference between your number three and your number four. Um, but what I would point out is that when I look at the trend uh, of what I'm experiencing and what, what I see is that as we move further away from the extreme disruptions, cost and cash, innovation and new product development have been moving up the list in priorities. And that naturally pushes risk management down when we think about the uh, supply chain priorities. So question may be why, right? I mean, you certainly could say, well, we're farther away from those most extreme uh, supply disruptions, right? So now they're not as present on mine. I think actually the way that I would think about it is that when we were in extreme disruption, the number one business priority was we need to solve these disruptions. Now, as we move away from those disruptions, businesses have to adapt, right? And they have to reevaluate how they need to apply their resources, right? And invest their resources. And how are they going to successfully compete in the marketplace? And there again, we start talking about, I need compelling products for my customers. I have to be cost competitive. So we're naturally refocusing our resources to where they best help us go compete uh, out in the marketplace. So I think that's the natural kind of tendency is you move your resources and your focus to where uh, it helps you succeed the most, right? But in general, I would still say risk management is still on people's minds. Um, we just have moved on a little bit, right? Now, what I would point out is if you look at third-party reports, um, you would say what's also rising is ESG, which is becoming a, a higher and higher priority. Um, but in this case, you know, I'm really think, seeing what what I'm experiencing from a from a uh, from a resource standpoint. Where are we pointing our resources? And that certainly has shifted more to cost, more to innovation, and new products. Okay, so we talked about the risks that are out there in the world, how they've changed. We talked about kind of the evolution of priorities uh, over the last few years. Um, let's take a minute to talk about what we've learned in the last few years. I'd say number one is that supply chain risk mitigation is hard. Now, I'll tell you this, I started working specifically in supply chain risk mitigation back in 2017-18. And it was something that we didn't have a formal program for uh, in our company. So I was really trying to get it off the ground. And that was really a combination of looking at um, like site continuity planning, but then also looking at unique capabilities, unique supply chain, specific risks in our own supply chains. And back then it was really hard because people didn't care, right? They they essentially didn't believe that a low probability event could happen. And they believed that, well, if it does, we'll be fine. We'll do something, right? And they may have had, a, 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 for example, an example of, well, we'll do this. Well, as we worked through the next few years, we started to kind of build some muscle in what would we really do and address problems. Um, but it was still hard, right? Because you're essentially asking to invest in something based on the fact that a very unlikely event may occur, therefore you may never have a return on that investment, right? So now we move forward, we don't really hear as much. People believe events can happen. They believe risk management is important, but it's still hard because you have to make really hard choices, right? So risk management's hard. Um, generally, there aren't quick fixes. You know, the reason a risk is not mitigated is because it requires some tough choices and some sustained efforts in order to mitigate it. And maybe the resources aren't available or the cost is high. Um, and also there are plenty of times when you really don't have really compelling good solutions for your risk management. So I think all of these have been learnings over the last few years that have to filter into how you develop a risk management strategy. Um, the second thing I'd say was, let's, let's see, think about how is this influencing what companies are doing? And I think the easy answer is 
they're trying to find balance, right? Again, we talked about priorities are changing. Companies have to go out and invest their resources to allow them to best compete. Um, companies are now that were outside of this extreme disruption, they're working to understand what can my business model support and what, what's the right balance uh, for risk mitigation uh, in the work we're doing. I think we're also taking hard looks at the work we did over the last few years, and especially in the cases that we had reactionary moves where you aren't seeing a return on investment for uh, for that particular strategy that you implemented. We're unwinding those, right? Because they're not effective or they don't have a, uh, um, a good return on investment. You're saying, okay, we're gonna unwind those in favor of something that's more productive. And then, then I think the third thing that uh, that companies are doing is they're investing in technology and tools, and these tools are are evolving uh, and improving very quickly. And here, there's kind of two things to think about, right? One is if I'm going to mitigate a uh, an impact in my supply chain, I need to be able to detect it. In essence, I need to be able to see it. The second thing is I need to be able to do the work in order to drive an action when I do see this disruption. So here's where the two where tools really help us in two ways, right? One, they can help us improve visibility. And then the second is, is that they can help us perform the analysis fast enough that we can take an action within the window of time we have to impact or mitigate that, that specific issue. And I don't wanna throw around buzzwords here, but this absolutely is a use case for AI when you think about how you drive fast analysis of alternatives to mitigate a particular impact within your supply chain. Uh, and I will say one thing, uh, as long as, you know, we're kind of talking about uh, events, you know, as we've moved further away, you know, one thing, you know, that we should have learned, but we always have to remind ourselves is that the occurrence or lack of occurrence of a low probability event doesn't change because it did happen or did not happen this year, right? So as we're mitigating risk, we always have to keep in mind that the probability of those events is the same, whether they happened or didn't happen, even though you know that experience may be farther away from us than it was unless, you know, let's say uh, there's less emotion around it, you know, now since we've moved a little further away. Okay, so now I wanna have another poll question here in a minute. And really this is about um, what factors are you thinking about as you're building your supply chain risk mitigation strategies? And this is really looking back to the factors that, uh, that I talked about a few years ago um, that at the time were really driving a lot of the thought process on how do we act? So Miguel, if we can throw the poll up there. When you think about what's yeah, driving, it's out. all right. So what's driving your action? Is it cost? Is it resource availability? Options, time, speed for implementation or other? Not surprisingly, I think cost is going to win. <laughs> let's it give it a, a by more uh, than a length. Yeah, let's <laughs> give a couple more seconds to our audience to vote. And all right, cost. Got it. Yeah, not surprising to me. Um, mitigating risk can be expensive. You know, you kind of think that uh, uh, the reason that we do the things we're doing in our supply chains is usually because uh, they're one of the most, the most cost advantage alternative in a lot of cases, right? So doing something different uh, certainly is a, uh, implies almost always there's going to be a cost to it, right? Um, but I'm going to kind of throw you a curveball here. Um, 
I would say as we think about today, these aren't really the factors that should be driving um, how we think about the risk mitigation strategies that we want to implement. I think we really have to now that we're outside of extreme disruption and now we're thinking less tactically, we're not as reactionary, you have to think about it from a business centric perspective, right? So now when we're thinking about how, what risk mitigation strategies are we gonna implement? We really have to think about it in, in, two, uh, in two ways. One is what is the goal, right? What are we trying to accomplish? Um, and this can fall into a lot of different categories. Um, are we trying to protect a portion of our earnings? Are we trying to protect a key product line? Are we trying to ensure we can support a key customer? Are we, pre are we preventing a particular production interruption at a particular facility, right? Um, these become really specific, right? Goal oriented. I am making this investment to accept, to accomplish this very specific goal. And then we have to think about it from a business centric standpoint in this sense, right? It's not as much that we are protecting the supply chain for the sake of protecting the supply chain. Protecting supply chain is accomplishing this business centric goal, right? Therefore, we can look at the cost, for example, in terms of protecting a customer relationship and the pro and the EBITDA related to that relationship or to a particular product line, or what is the right balance of protecting the most percentage of our earnings versus the investment that we make. And you have, because you have to be strategic, right? It's if it was even possible, it would be incredibly expensive to mitigate all risks at every stage of the supply chain, right? And I would say it's probably just impossible, right, to do. Um, but in any case, always very, very expensive. So that's why you have to get really clear on what is the, the business goal, business-centric goal that I am trying to accomplish by developing this strategy. And I can tell you in the discussions that uh, that I'm part of, We'll develop strategies. There's a lot of time and energy resources put into some of the strategy work. And it's very common that you hear, okay, well, but when we implement this strategy, because there's been an event, we won't be able to service our business, our uh, customers as business as usual. And the answer is that's exactly right, because it won't be business as usual. We've just had a major event and a disruption, right? Therefore, we're no longer in BAU scenario, right? We are now in, you know, activating our risk mitigation plan. Uh, and that may mean that we can't service every customer and every product line uh, that we were servicing before, right? Because we've decided that our strategy is going to protect something very specific um, when it's executed. So, okay. Moving on, I'd like to kind of talk about key takeaways here. One, we are still in an environment full of risk. Uh, you kind of go back to the list. Uh, I would say that we are experiencing a constant, you know, steady stream of smaller disruptions. It's not the extreme disruption that we saw a few years ago, but I think we have to admit these disruptions are still out there. Our teams are still having to work with them every day. Um, we're having to do that in an environment where managing risk is not as likely to be our number one priority. It's a, a priority and it's part of our strategy, right? For what, how we're operating our, our supply chains. Um, we have to make tough decisions, right? We can't manage all risks. We have to get really specific and be targeted at what risk we're going to manage and where we're going to manage them in the supply chain. These, How we manage these risks and the risks that we manage are going to be based on business-centric goals, right? We're not managing supply chain risk for the sake of managing supply chain risk. We're managing, managing it in order to protect the business and attaching it to clear business goals. 
And then increasingly we're leveraging uh, tools to help us, right? Again, if I can see an interruption or a risk with enough time to, to take an action, and if I can speed up how fast I can do an analysis, that gives me the opportunity to mitigate most risks that come into the supply chain or a greater number of those risks, which is really important. And with that, Miguel, Jeff, I'm at the end and we're open for any questions. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jimmy. I, I love the, the presentation, the talk, and those connections with, uh, with you actually shared with us a couple of years ago. I think it, it gives the uh, the audience uh, and all of us also like a broader perspective of how things evolve over time. And because actually one of the things that I wanted to mention at the beginning is, uh, you know, the uh, I, that I love the short term uh, mentality bias that uh, we all have. And this does not only apply to supply chains or, or anything. I actually love a, a book by a hedge fund manager, Ray Dalio. I know you guys are familiar with it, but you can draw a lot of uh, you know conclusions and correlate with this because the, the the book is called Changing World Order, and basically it talks about what you mentioned. You know the those black strong events uh, that regardless if they have happened or not, the, the impact is going to be the same. Uh, but we all are totally biased by our own experiences, and, and as human beings, that has happened forever. Sadly, that's the reason why wars happen over time because generations forget what their parents, grandparents have uh, like seen in the past. So yeah, supply chains are, are no different um, for better or worse. So I, I think that is uh, an amazing takeaway from everything that you have brought. So going right away into the questions, another thing that I also wanted to highlight, and it's connected to a question by Santiago Rendon, uh, is what you mentioned about AI. Uh, everybody, you know, it's, it's a buzzword, but um, everybody's excited about it, what it can do, what it cannot do. So in terms of, you know, the, the tools that uh, provide visibility and predictability for this kind of uh, risk management strategies, but also the, the fast analysis that, that you mentioned, can you be a little bit more specific of maybe yeah. one, uh, you know, use case that uh, you guys have, uh, like, I don't know, put into place? And well, I, I can tell you what we've been, uh, what we're looking at and what we find interesting, because uh, I'll, I'll give you the context that, we don't have the fear of missing out. What we want to do is make sure when we make investments uh, that we're making the right investments. So we're being very careful to look at these tools as they evolve and kind of make sure that when we when we do make the decision to, in, to make big investments, that we're convinced the companies and the tools are, are fully evolved, are evolved, right? But the most compelling use case we've seen is really specific to... Uh, to detecting a, an interruption. This could be in transportation or material availability. And then the system being able to, to go out um, and go across your supply chain and determine how you would reschedule your production, reschedule the order of your raw materials coming in, reallocate you to your distribution uh, in order to mitigate that disruption. So if you think about that, um, and I'll put it in kind of real world terms, um, if we have a particular commodity where we determine that we have um, variation in the delivery time on containers, and that impacts supply positively on one side of the country and negatively on the other side of the country, we can transfer products throughout our distribution network. But in order to make a good decision there, I need to then look at all the incoming goods coming across the entire network. I need to then look at what all the demand profiles for those goods are coming that are going out. And, and then I need to look at the variation in each of those and determine whether or not I'm just going to create a whack-a-mole situation where I'm going to move it from one place and then create a problem in that place, right? Um, and the reality is, is that your decision time horizon to make to determine if you want to do that is pretty short, right? You you want to make that decision maybe in a number of hours. Well, it's very hard to repeat that within your organization when you have a really complex environment to constantly repeat that analysis 
and drive a decision. Here's where AI can help. When it goes in and creates those alternatives, you can look at the impact of, of scenarios. And when you approve them, well, then it can go issue new orders, cancel orders, change orders, whereas it would take potentially hours for individuals. Now we've done the analysis. Now somebody has to go physically go in and change all of these individual, uh, we'll say they, they may be orders to external suppliers or orders within your own intercompany network. So that's where this use case becomes really interesting is I can see the problem. Okay, a lot of times I can see the problem with the tools we've been adopting, but how fast can I actually determine my alternatives, the impacts of those alternatives, and then actually implement? And that's where there can be a lot of help in the future from some of the AI tools. Yeah. No, thank you so much. Like amazing use case. Thank you for <laughs> going such a a level of detail to uh, to actually being able to you know to to show exactly how it works, what you guys have in mind. Because I think it's super useful for for the audience to to have an example uh, of how these tools help. Jeff, yeah. do do you want to take the next question? Yeah, no, thanks. Um, and and Jimmy, I think you made a great point that just because we had a a black swan event does not mean that we're not going to have another black swan event. Uh, the the probabilities are are totally independent of one another. So it's a it's a great point to drive home. So one question was um, with the use of these tools, the use of AI, we're kind of in this detection mode. It's like is that forcing us too much um, in the short term and not enough into long term prevention? And how do you strike a balance between those two? Yeah, so I for at, at the moment, you know, when I think about um, where we're using AI, you know, there are places where it's already been pervasive, but you really didn't think about it. So if you think about financial risk monitoring, right, uh, for your supply chain health, when you're looking at all the different players in your supply chain, that's a place where you've already had AI uh, operating, right? And I think that's a strategic tool because you're really you've got governance there, but you're also trying to determine, do I have a particular node in my supply chain that I should be concerned about? I need to go mitigate something there and you want to see it before that supplier closes or has some type of, of, uh, of disruption, which impacts you, right? So I think there, there are already strategic use cases out there, but I think when we think about this division, um, right now, we're seeing the next use cases for AI are more on the execution side, right? Allowing you to see, to detect and then drive the alternatives, uh, scenarios, and then drive action. Whereas when you think about the more generalized risk mitigation and, and your risk mitigation strategy, you know, really here you're developing for that very specific supply chain, what are going to be the fundamentals of supply chain risk management within that end-to-end -end chain, right? And that that really starts making you question, okay, I have an entire supply chain. I'm not going to mitigate every risk at every node, but I'm going to look and see based on the structure of that supply chain, where should I mitigate risks? Uh, and at what cost, right? And, and, and for example, you know, we like to leave out the idea that I can always mitigate a risk with inventory, right? I can say I recognize that I have a lot of uh, risks within the supply chain. Uh, I don't have an economic solution to mitigate all of those, but I can hold more inventory of finished product available for my customers. That, that may be my mitigation strategy, right? And of course, that'd be tied back to what do I think my normal time of recovery would be to mitigate some issue that pops up within the NDN supply chain. And okay, now I need to proportionally carry more inventory. Um, but that's a really strategic question, right? Based on that end-to-end -end supply chain. And that takes a lot of work, right? Because you really have to understand that entire supply chain and the dy dynamics at each node to make those kind of decisions. Can't hear you, Jeff. Jeff, you're mute. Yeah. Oh, I, sorry. I just said thanks, Jimmy. And I asked Miguel, do you have a follow up question? Yeah, we, we have a lot of questions. So <laughs> we'll have to uh, like be really selective. But yeah. And um, so I think it was interesting, Jimmy, that you mentioned, you know, uh, how you 
actually prioritize uh, where to focus in terms of risk management. Because, of course, when you look at a supply chain, you're probably going to be looking at single points of failure, like in terms of, okay, uh, suppliers that uh, are unique for a certain uh, product that is critical, uh, long lead times whatsoever. Uh, so I I'm going to connect this with a really interesting question by uh, Rafael Genavel. Uh, so this um, a person from the audience is asking, how did you actually measure the success of a supply chain mitigation plan. Uh, I'm really interested to, to hear your thoughts on this because we know different companies do it in different ways. And sometimes it's hard because you don't have a clear ROI on any of this because the best case scenario is actually the disruption didn't happen. That's the best thing that can happen. But then the risk mitigation plan somehow doesn't have an ROI. So how do you guys do it? And what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so I'll tell you the conversations that we have, right? And so for example, in the... Uh, Kind of the example you gave you we go out and we look at single points of failure right so there have been cases where we built a strategy and executed where part of the strategy is inventory at key nodes in the supply chain and what we're constantly looking at is okay are we accessing these right you know how are they being used and what is the cost right so if we look at it and we start measuring the cost on a particular, uh, a partic the execution of a particular part of that strategy, and we start to recognize that the cost benefit doesn't work, um, the costs are more than we thought, uh, there are other options, we'll say, okay, we need to change that, right? Um, but then when we, to your point, okay, well, how are you really measuring the effectiveness? Um, we're really getting back to, you know, did we have an interruption that was that was based on the fact that this strategy did not work? Um, interestingly enough, we still haven't gotten to a place where I would say in the key areas where we've executed strategy, there are zero disruptions. So they're still, they're just not as extreme. So we've been able to to say no we we can document this many times during the year we had to actually implement we had to actually execute versus that strategy in order to maintain continuity so it'll get a lot harder in the future if for example the level of disruption goes down and you have a period of time where you say i at the strategy still executed it still has a cost but we didn't at any point have to actually use that uh, use that to run the business. Yeah. So um, so right now, I would say we haven't really been tested um, in that sense because your point and the point I made, you've made, I think that one of the bigger points around risk mitigation is you are making an investment, not sure that there will ever be a return on it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, you want to take the yeah, next one? Yeah, no, it, it's kind of like an insurance option, right? You you totally. don't you don't know you need it until you absolutely you don't want need to it. use it. You don't want to <laughs> yeah. use it, yeah. Never want to use it, uh, but you always want to get the lowest price on the insurance, right? So, <clears throat> in regard to the uh, labor turnover issues, um, what are some strategies that you, your company, your suppliers um, are using to mitigate these labor turnover issues? Yeah, so I would call it uh, the back to the future strategy. Um, I'm old enough uh, that I remember a time when, uh, you know, the most common way that you uh, you develop talent is you develop them, right? That you actually hired people at different stages of their career, and then you invested in developing, you know, a robust pipeline of talent within your organization, right? Um, and that could, and that wasn't uh, function specific. That was more kind of cultural, right? And and I would say that uh, that's not hasn't been universally true. Um, at all, you know, when we think about generally over the uh, over businesses today in the Western world, I can tell you the organization that I'm in. If I was to dial back five years ago, it's what we call a pro in position uh, organization. We only hired people who were already qualified for the position, right? Um, so there were there was no pipeline of people. So if you lost someone, 
you needed to go hire another pro in position, right? Um, so I would say now what we've done over the last three or four years is, you know, we changed the strategy and we said, um, we're going to believe that turnover will be higher in the future than what it's been traditionally. We're not going to, uh, we're going to embrace that, right? And say, okay, that's just a new fixture of, of how the labor force functions. And we think company culture is important. We can't constantly be having to recruit in new people who don't understand the, the company. So we're going to need to now, you know, have a pipeline where we're hiring people in earlier in their careers, preparing them to take on more responsibility. Um, and at the times when we may have people who who move internally, which which happens, right? They don't leave the company, but they go to a different part of the company. Uh, or, you know, if they do actually exit the company, we want to feel like we have people who are then ready, both from a skill set standpoint and a company culture standpoint to move into those positions. And uh, and I really think that, that that's going to be very important uh, when you think about how you're going to have continuity in the future. Um, it's very difficult, even when you hire very skilled people, if they're not in your business long enough, mm -hmm. they haven't had the opportunity to truly experience and understand how everything works. And again, back to the comment I made, you can have fantastic systems, but in the end, we also have a people system that we depend on, right? And it's a system of people who have a common understanding of how things should work, right? No, that that that's fantastic. It highlights the need to, I think you you touched upon culture is important. You hire the right people, but you got to make sure that the right people stay there. And and so you're you're actually seeing supply chain as a a source of competitive advantage, whereas some people might see it as you know, we're just shuffling products from here to there. It's a cost center type of a thing. No, no it's, I think that's a fantastic point, right? And uh, and I can't remember where the quote came from, but I've, I've heard it before, which is, you know, the future for successful companies is you're battling on brands and you're battling on supply chains, right? You got to you got to have compelling products and brands for your consumers and you got to be able to execute on the supply chain side. It's not either or. Right. And it's a supply chain several layers deep, too. It's not just you. It's you and your suppliers and your supplier suppliers and your customers. Absolutely. Excellent. An interesting question I got here. Um, what about the risk of cybersecurity? Are you guys doing anything on cybersecurity? So that's outside of our scope, but it's a huge focus uh, within the company. Um, and and I think it's it's a it's a big deal, right? So um, more and more, we will challenge our our supply chain, right, to have continuity plans in place. Uh, depending on who they are, those can be different. Um, but it's it's a bigger and bigger focus because it's real. And I it should have been a poll question. I I would be interested to know only because I have a personal experience. You know how many people have been impacted because somewhere in their supply chain there was a cybersecurity event that impacted the flow of products. I I would guess it's hot. It's, it's definitely a hot topic even here at MIT. We, we're uh, actively working on a project in, in that in terms of understanding a little bit more what's going on with supply chains because as supply chains get like more connected and not only on a physical um, like uh, matter, but also digitally, uh, you have like all the software right now going into the cloud, like shared systems, shared clients. So the attack surface like increases dramatically. Uh, so definitely uh, a huge topic, but it's, it's 1050 here. So I, I want to be really respectful with everybody's time, uh, like mainly Jimmy's. Um, and we still have a lot of questions. Like, uh, thank you so much to the audience for sending all those. Uh, but we, we cannot cover everything. And um, so, just to to wrap it up, I just uh, want to say thank you again, um, like Jimmy. Uh, thank you, everybody uh, who decided to join us today. It's been a super insightful session in, in supply risk management. I, I, I loved it. And um, before we say goodbye, just want to remind the audience a couple of things. 
So first, this was the last uh, event of the spring series. So we are not going to see you for, for a little bit now until SE1X and SE2X come back in September. Um, but of course, SEX courses are still available. And they are going to open soon, uh, SE2X and SE4X in a couple of weeks. So guys, just stay tuned and continue the path of the MicroMasters if you love what we do, if you love the content. So again, thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Jeff, Jimmy, any final words that uh, you want to say to the audience? Yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'll just, sorry, I'll just wrap up real quick. We got a lot of people say no, 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 don't go, and, and a lot, <laughs> it's a lot of the, the the chat part is blowing up, Jimmy. Um, so fantastic job. Uh, looks like very well received. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Of course, thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day.